Right, cheers for coming down, everyone. Hi, Chris. Hiya. And Max. And Jen. And strange faces that I don't know, and that I do know, and that are new friends. Uh, so yeah, so I, this is a talk that I did a few weeks ago for the History of Art team at Aberdeen Uni. And they sort of kindly invited me to speak a bit about what I do and about some of the platforms and support mechanisms and stuff I've helped to sort of build up and to, you know, just a bit about me and the blog. And I find it was quite interesting to sort of look at my own personal history because I'm so used to focusing on other people and being like, check out this guy, they're making really cool work or like this person's doing something really interesting and they deserve some like shine, you know? So it was really weird to sort of turn that lens on myself and be like, ah, oh, oh my God, I've done quite a lot and like, I've got like all these amazing people that I've met through the things I do. So it's been really uh, quite heartening to look back on stuff and to see my journey alongside the people I've supported and the people that I've tried to give a, a leg up to or tried to elevate or, or even just share in their work, you know? And there were certain themes that started to come out in the, in, when I was looking through my history and stuff. So I'm basically just gonna speak a, a load of stuff about that and try and connect up a few dots about different things. Uh, because it was at the uni, I didn't want it to be boring. So this is my first slide where I was trying to employ the sort of street art graffiti thing of putting secret messages in there. Uh, you know, because often these presentations are quite boring and can be quite like heavy. Uh, but looking at my history, I was interested in why certain artists become popular and why they gain sort of notoriety sometimes after their death in the case of like Van Gogh. And it, it really sort of made me think about why artists become famous. Uh, or what it is about their work, or who, who are the people that sort of make them who they are. Uh, I was quite chuffed because I grew up with a Van Gogh in my mum and dad's house in Maastricht. Uh, so they actually had a print of this on the wall, uh, which was sort of some of my early exposure to sort of fine art and the sort of, you know, the, the well-known artists like the Van Goghs and the Gauguins and these kind of people. For the purpose of this talk though, I am going to speak about me. I'm going to talk about blogging, archiving and connecting. And then I speak a little bit about the support mechanisms and the good and the bad of social media and online platforms. Uh, because obviously I do a lot trying to connect all those things up and then I have major anxiety and then I'm like, I'm posting too much and people are bored and like, who gives a fuck? Who wants to listen to me warble a load of shit? So I sort of have this love-hate relationship with it, but then I've kind of made my peace where it's like, if I'm trying to support other people, then I'll do my very best to do that, which means sharing as much as possible, even if it becomes annoying to, to people. Uh, I like to physically engage and get really stuck into art. So that's me literally sticking my head into something at Luke again. But I really love that photo. You know, it's like that, that, is, that is to me what engaging with art should look like in some senses. I've always been pretty cool. This is me in my bedroom, <laughs> uh, in my tracksuit. And I've always liked sort of collecting things. So Star uh, Lego was, was a big one. And then remember getting into The Simpsons when it first sort of came on British TV and you know, My Pet Monster and Dennis the Menace comics and stuff, and Star Wars. So Star Wars has been a big one uh, from my childhood that's kind of come into my adult life. Uh, and I, I was looking at sort of certain themes in my family and certain ideas, looking at things around collecting. And, you know, a, an image like this really appeals to me. I love how it's laid out. I love how they're all organized and they're numbered. And I'm like, you know, I'm sort of slowly ticking them off in my personal collection as an adult. So I don't have children, so I spend all my spare income buying Star Wars toys. Uh, I'm one of those guys, unfortunately. But I thought this was, it was really interesting, sort of connecting this collecting habit with sort of what I do through the blog. Uh, growing up, uh, I went to the grammar school. So this is a beautiful illustration by Gabby Reith. And again, I was interested in this sort of history. You know, we have Lord Byron sitting out the front of the school, and yet almost every kid that comes through the grammar sort of makes a joke about Byron getting expelled after like a week because he was a little shit. Uh, he only attended the school for a year and a half or two years before he was moved down south with his, his family. Uh, but it's interesting that you know, his later achievements in life were worthy of him being honored with this sort of statue in front of the grammar. Uh, and yeah, going to the grammar, I, I met lots of interesting people. Looking at Gabby's sort of architecture stuff, again, looking at that collecting thing I was just mentioning, you know, I really like the sort of layout and seeing all these things collected together and sort of showcased in that sort of manner. Uh, but school was an interesting time. Obviously, music became the sort of big defining thing. You know, what bands are you listening to? 
Uh, I remember getting my very first CD. It was Zig and Zag, The Girls, They All Love Me. And uh, of course, going to the grammar school, it was sort of like became very different, became quite tribal, you know. Uh, I remember my older brother coming home with this cigarette packet cassette tape for those that know what cassettes were. Uh, I think they're actually coming back into fashion now, to be honest. But I remember seeing that and thinking, oh, that is like the coolest thing I've ever seen. It's like a fag packet, but it's got a tape in it. And then the music on this tape is like blowing my mind, you know, cigarettes and alcohol. They're singing about fucking getting out there and getting it, you know. And then, of course, it was only recently I realized it's just T-Rex. It's just Mark Bolin ripoffs completely. Uh, so I was interested in the idea of like these things that are new or felt like they were brand new at the time are actually quite old and have a lot of history. You know, my dad took down him and my mum's records and put the Beatles on for us because Oasis were speaking about the Beatles, but we'd never actually heard them. And of course, this is pre-internet, so you couldn't just go and Google it or YouTube, what, you know, who are the Beatles? Uh, so that was quite revolutionary, realising that my parents also had this interest in sort of music and cultures and how things could sort of connect up. And then obviously in secondary school, uh, hanging out in the higher art department, uh, it became a sort of refuge and a place to sort of find yourself, you know, discovering the who and Quadrophenia and Jimmy's story was like this sort of revolutionary movie. And then seeing that my art teacher had a postcard for it on our wall was like, wow, she must be really cool because she's into Quadrophenia. I stole that postcard though. I was like, I wanted for my wall. <laughs> uh, the other big thing I discovered was the, uh, the graphic art of Japan and uh, especially the Hokusai wave. I remember seeing this image and it was the first piece of art that really like touched me. You know, I looked at it and I was, I was just mesmerized by it. I couldn't stop like going back to the book and looking at it. Uh, you know, I was just completely transfixed by the shapes and the colors and the iconography of it. And then again, the idea of Hokusai collecting these waves, you know, the fact there was 36 views, but at that time, the internet was still in its infancy. So you couldn't just go and Google it. You know, you'd literally have to go and find library books and art books and try and put all the pieces together, uh, which was a bit of a, an, an impossible task really at the time. Of course, music tastes and sort of things changed when OK Computer by Radiohead came out. So up till that point, I was very much an indie boy and it was Oasis and the Beatles and the Stone Roses and nothing else. And then got the, the second Radiohead album and then OK Computer came out in like 97, but I only started listening to it in 1998. So I can remember exactly like the moment and I, I put all my Radiohead CDs at the start of my CD collection and I remember my brother coming home and being like, oh I, Radiohead your favorite band now, are they? And I was like, yeah, what of it? And that was me sort of starting to define myself as a person and starting to connect with different kinds of cultures, you know? Uh, Oasis was very laddie and very much a one-way street as far as taste and sort of how you behaved was. Whereas Radiohead were, you know, speaking about trip hop and introducing me to all these different types of music uh, that just felt really revolutionary. And it was like every new thing was like just set off a little happy trigger in my brain, you know. Uh, this is me and my brother in our, our shared bedroom. So here you can see his CD collection with Oasis at the front. And we had our Oasis posters. But even then, you know, things like we had Bell and Sebastian and then Oasis, but then we had like the Chemical Brothers. So music was like changing in a way that things were becoming open to you. You know, it wasn't just like the dance kids and the indie kids and the rock and roll kids. It was like everything was starting to mix up. Uh, my brother was also quite an early adopter in the world of graphic design, which is why we've got this fucking massive monitor here. Uh, I remember just, you know, we've got a scanner. He's got a scanner up here as well and his speakers. I mean, you literally couldn't like find anything on the internet. There was like three websites or something. <laughs> but you know, the fact that we had this, it was like getting into those digital worlds and sort of getting into, you know, new ways of doing things and, and sort of discovering information. Uh, and skateboarding was one of those things that I got into that really took me on a journey. Again, always been pretty cool in my fashion, as you can see. So is my brother, you know. Uh, it's been quite interesting to get to an age where, you know, you sort of start to feel like you're maybe getting a bit on in years and then the things you were wearing as a kid in the 80s are suddenly like super fashionable again. Uh, I think that's, that's something that we, we realise everything's sort of cyclical, you know, everything comes round again. 
Uh, but we, we were there at the start, you know, rocking the big skateboard. I think I probably skated it about twice and then my dad snapped it in half because being a hemophiliac, skateboarding was a big no-no uh, because obviously I would just hit a stone and like tank and then that was a week in hospital. Uh, but I took it up again as a teenager. Uh, and then being Aberdeen and being a skater is quite an interesting one because obviously photos like this might sort of look a bit nondescript, uh, but this is an Aberdeen skater called John Rattray who went on to do quite amazing things in the world of professional skateboarding. Uh, he's also a really lovely guy. Uh, he does a, a, a mission called Why So Sad to raise awareness about mental health issues and about suicide prevention as well. So I highly recommend uh, having a look at the work that he does for that. But images like this uh, by Alex Irvin, you know, I, it started me connecting the dots a little bit. So you've got John doing a wall ride at South College Street. If you've ever seen these banks, it's like quite a ridiculous thing he's doing here to get up there and to get down and roll away. But I also love the graffiti, Aiden thugs kill all visiting fans. So you've got three subcultures, because you've got the subculture of skateboarding, which I was heavily into. And then you've got the subculture of graffiti and writing things on walls. And then you've got the football subculture, that's where the graffiti's come from. So I like the idea that like, those three things actually connected uh, through these photographs by Alex. And then of course, being a skater, this was our mecca. This is uh, St. Nicholas House opening in the late 1960s. So this is all the happy staff filing in. And then this is the area here that we would uh, practice our sort of maneuvers and our skate tricks. And it became a real interesting place because it became a creative space, essentially, where people would sort of avoid you and walk along here and sort of scowl at you. You know, we were, we were using this space for our own expression of creativity. Uh, here's Callum doing a board slide on the grit bin. So this was one of the, the sort of pinnacles if you could get up on here and maybe get a few grinds or a board slide, but if you could get along here and get onto that, you know, it was like, it was pretty cool. Uh, this is Mike Hume's illustration of it. So he even rendered it as a piece of art, just taking out the details and sort of leaving the bits that were important to us. I'll always remember getting board slides off the end of here and rolling away. It was like, because I couldn't get it for years. And then one day it was like, oh, you just do a little, you know, a little movement, a little performance, a little dance, and then you'll, you'll roll away. And I did that for years. Uh, unfortunately, my knees no longer allow me to skateboard. But through that space, I sort of discovered that not all creative spaces are welcome uh, or how we use them is perhaps not welcome. So this is Broad Street as it used to be. Uh, and this was the sort of gauntlet. And then this is what the council spent hundreds of thousands of pounds doing to it. And of course, nowadays we look at things like that and we start to see more this sort of defensive architecture, you know, putting spikes on benches so homeless people can't sleep in them, things like that. You know, I, I read a great article where a skater said, this is actually really nasty when councils do stuff like this. This isn't for people, this is actually really nasty and this is a show of force. So I was always kind of interested in that dynamic, you know, not all creative spaces are welcome, uh, depending on who's deciding what can happen there. And again, this is me as a, a young man at college. And it, it's funny because I sort of look at it now and it's like, it's just a nondescript grungy kid you know, but I've got my hand-drawn Radiohead bear on my jacket there. And that was a time where if you saw that symbol, it might mean something to you. And I've got on a Zero Skateboards hoodie. So if you wore skater shoes and wore a skateboard hoodie, chances are we'd be friends if we met each other in the street, you know. Whereas fashion and things have consumed everything and it's everything is everything to everyone nowadays. Whereas growing up for me, it was very much like, this is my tribe, this is my people, this is where I belong, you know. So yeah, the, the Radiohead symbol... Uh, I absolutely love it. I don't know. I don't know exactly what it is. Maybe it's just so clean. Uh, but yeah. And of course, at that time in the early, so this is the early 2000s, lots of gigs going on, lots of interesting bands coming to Aberdeen and traveling to see bands in Glasgow. Uh, friends were in bands making music and I was getting into photography and documenting them. We even got David Shrigley to do a flyer for one of their gigs. Uh, where he would do flyers for you for like either free or certainly a, a minimal fee. Uh, so this was one he did for my pal's bands at the tunnels. You know, now, nowadays you're talking about three, four thousand pounds for a print of his. So it's quite amazing to sort of see these artists that have sort of elevated up. And again, starting to connect dots, you know, music, art, subcultures, all these things were starting to sort of cross over in my, my, my early life. 
uh, comics, you know, getting into comic book art, getting into different types of expression and creativity. Uh, working in the comic shop, uh, Forbidden Planet, was great for introducing me to lots of different people and seeing lots of different things. And yet, artists like Jim Lee are, are revered within the comic book world, but you might not find them in a gallery. Or you might not find them in the sort of contemporary art galleries that you'll go and see a Van Gogh or a Gauguin in. So again, interesting that it's welcome in some spheres, but it's not welcome in all, you know? Depending on who's, you know, controlling the door or sort of gatekeeping, as we say. Uh, at Forbidden Planet, I met Robert England from uh, Freddy, well, that is Freddy Krueger. That's what he looks like as a normal guy. Uh, so the comic shop was great for sort of being exposed to lots of different people. That's my signed photograph there at the bottom and he wrote, to John, sleep kills. And I was like, you fucker, you have no idea how many nightmares you gave me as a child <laughs> watching your films when my mum and dad were out and then waiting for your hand to come up the toilet and jab my balls with your spiky glove. So uh, yeah, scary days. But I mean, you know, again, studded bracelet. I've got a wristband that says psycho you know, trying to define myself and sort of be my own person. Uh, I was immortalised in a portrait by Stu Allen, uh, who's a very good friend and has been for a, a long time. Uh, this was actually part of Stu's degree show. And I remember seeing it and I was like, oh my God, I'm, I've been immortalised as a piece of art. This is amazing. And I thought, I'll wait until after the degree show and I'll give him like an offer and buy it off him. I don't want to buy it for the full price because I can't afford it, but I'll wait until he's maybe a bit skint and then I'll like you know, we'll do a deal with him. And of course that painting sold the first night of his degree show, opening night, done, red sticker on it. I believe uh, Aberdeenshire Council bought it. So I never got a chance to own that portrait, unfortunately. But again, it was, you know, being immortalized in that way, it was like seeing the power of art and seeing how amazing it can be and, you know, how transformative it can be as well. Uh, my own journey into art sort of came through the band Sigur Ross, really. Uh, they did an album called was Brackets in the early, I think it was 2000 that came out. And then this was one of the free stencils that came with it. But you could also buy the stencils off their website. I remember there was a canvas of this that the singer had done in One Up that they gave like 100 record shops in the UK got these canvases for the band. And I remember that was my first exposure to kind of stencil art. And then later on in the sort of mid 2000s, books like Street Renegades came out sharing the work of like Mark Jenkins and Ben Ein and these sort of international street artists who were all sort of making quite interesting work that was different from the graffiti and the other stuff I'd sort of been documenting up to that point. Uh, and it felt kind of new and exciting. But one of the things I love about the, the sort of connecting the dots is, so looking for the slides for this talk, I found that image and then this showed up which is the original photograph, and I'd never seen it before. So 22 years later, I was able to kind of solve a mystery about who the little sleepwalking child was. And it was a photograph by this guy, John Yang. Uh, so there's a whole blog sort of connecting the dots there that was really interesting to read. And amazing looking at John Yang's work as well and seeing his personal story. So yeah, so looking at my sort of journey so far, uh, you know, it was like me in the middle, obviously, and then I went and did photography, and then the internet came up, but I was really into music, and then music sort of led to, photography led to street art, but then I was always interested in art, and then there was skateboarding, but skateboarding is art, and then I had loads of friends that went to art school, and then it all sort of merges into these cultural spaces and people. Uh, Greys especially, got fond memories of hanging out there, didn't actually go there, even though they think I maybe did. But I had a, an ex-girlfriend or a girlfriend at the time who attended and I would go and hang out with her at lunchtime and all their arty pals. And I was like, this is really cool being in studios and being surrounded by creative people. But it did seem like once they finished their time at Grey's, there was a bit of a, a roadblock, like things sort of stopped, you know, uh, buzzing inside the building for what they're doing. And then as soon as you're out the door, it's sort of see you later. Uh, and of course, you know, we get this, uh, this has been a, a, a pervading attitude in Aberdeen for decades. So this was a recent addition on Reddit, uh, which, which I just sort of, I mean, this is, this is important because this is, this is why I started doing what I do. And I understand what the author is saying, but at the same time, it's like, man, fucking life's what you make it, you know? Uh, if you think Aberdeen's fucking boring, then I'm probably not going to come round to your house for a party because you're probably quite boring as well. But, you know, friends did start doing interesting things within the sort of contemporary art world. Uh, this is Project Slogan and Tory. 
uh, which ran for a number of years before moving into uh, Langstein Place. And then, you know, that notion, nothing happens here, Aberdeen shit. And it's like, well, I went to like an exhibition opening where I drew something on the wall that got turned into a zine. I went to see the band Errors at the Lemon Tree and then I had friends DJing in Cellar 35 after. So I did three cultural things in one night that I thought was quite interesting. So it's not that nothing happens, but maybe it's just not that well promoted or it's not shared with the right audience. So I decided I would start a blog, and then this is my first blog post. Hey, I don't really have much to report at the moment, so I'm just going to point you towards some websites and other blogs that might be of interest to you. I like street art, graffiti, and art-related stuff. This is 2008, by the way. Uh, so that's mostly what I'll be blogging about here, so check back soon. In the meantime, check out, we've got Craig Barman, Brian Ross, Project Slogan, which is no longer here, and then some of the blogs that had kind of inspired me. Uh, and then I met, earlier on, I met Craig, helping him carry some giant logs up to his flat in Sanderland through my friend Rory, who was in one of the bands. And Craig was just this like lightning rod of like interesting things. And he was a really interesting dude. And of course he was like, oh, you know, me and Brian are going to paint in Union Terrace Gardens if you want to come down and hang out. And I was like, oh, I'll take my camera and, you know, we can do some stuff. And then, you know, that was happening. Project Slogan was starting to sort of do interesting things. You know, you've got the Utes over there. Strange to think these are probably all adults now that probably have their own families. Uh, and Peacocks was also another interesting space where events were happening and stuff was going on. This is Remy Ruff and a big DJ night we had uh, with Remy's five grand canvases. And I just remember everyone just pawing at them by the end of the night, just sweat, sweat box. You know, it was just an absolute blast. Uh, so there was interest in cultural spaces. And then trips to London and stuff was showing me the work and showing me things that I was looking at in the book. So I was making real world connections to this new street art movement that had sort of captivated my, uh, my attention. And even back in Aberdeen, there was cultural crossovers happening. So this was a diesel t-shirt launch in Attic and they had a DJ, you know, and there was like late night opening and there was beers and it was like, oh, well, this is, this is cool. You know, this is something. There's something, something's happening here that's quite nice, you know. This isn't just boring Aberdeen where nothing happens. This is, you know, this is a, an event. Uh, this is me with the uh, limousine bull door. So this is one of the first sort of bits of sort of public street art I remember seeing, uh, painted by Brian that also helped Craig with the, the work at, uh, at Union Terrace Gardens. So it was almost like the idea of, like there were symbols and signs out there, but you kind of had to connect the dots and they were sort of di disparate and sort of spread out through the city. Uh, and yet I found myself connecting quite a lot and connecting to a lot through the blog and through capturing the stuff that was there. Primarily not street art, because there wasn't a lot of street art at the time. And there was, there was a graffiti scene, but I was very much on the periphery of that and wasn't really connected to the artists that were involved, because it was still that point where if you get caught tagging or you get caught doing a stencil, you will get arrested for it. You know, like I ended up in police cells for an hour and I got my DNA taken and fingerprints and I've got a letter from the court telling me they could have charged me and all this shit for like A4 Lego brick stencils, you know. So this, this is very much a sort of different time, but an exciting time because there was so much happening and so much stuff to go out and engage with. Uh, but again, people weren't or people weren't aware of it or people were in their own sort of bubbles. Even organisations were in their bubbles and were sort of failing to share each other's work or to or to cross over on an audience front. So of course I got stuck in uh, documenting the arts events and the artists and going to stuff. Uh, my friend Anita was one of the first ones I did where she drew inside the gallery in Torrey at Project Slogan. Uh, and then Craig obviously in Union Terrace Gardens with Brian and they literally just painted this cardboard canvas and then once they'd finished painting one side they rotated it and painted the next side and rotated it and just kept painting throughout the day. And then, of course, people started coming down, friends, family, uh, skate kids like Gav, just random passers-by, like, what are you up to? You know, what is it? It's, like, it's art. It's art in, in the public realm, you know? I mean, it's weird now to think with new art and the things we have and the street art we have now, this was like, this was revolutionary almost, or it felt revolutionary to me, you know? Uh, I'm sure these things have probably been happening for decades. We just don't know about it. Uh, but yeah, this was a, a short video I made. So I did a time lapse 
Originally, the original time lapse was 20 minutes long, which I realised is a ridiculous length for a time lapse movie. <laughs> uh, so I, I managed to sort of download a, a crap version of the files and sort of re-edit it a little bit, so you kind of get an idea of what Craig and Brian were doing throughout the day. And of course, I was just standing there with my camera, like trying to do weird things and just having fun with it. But uh, you know, it was a real, a real sort of introduction to a different kind of art and a different way of being, which I, I really resonated with. Street art, but in a, you know, a, a sort of or vandalism without the sort of victim. You know, it's like harmless, and yet there's still people that would have probably come down and be like, you "Shouldn't be doing that. You got a permit. Have you got permission to do that?" You know. Uh, but yeah, luckily Craig and Brian are are hard asses, and they just paint paint regardless. But it was a great project, a great starting point for what I was going to do with the blog, like having these people around me that I was interested in. And Craig's a, an artist whose journey I've followed f since that time. Uh, and that was one of the things I realised. I've got slight sort of favourites that I, I've, I've kept up with and sort of followed their journey uh, throughout the sort of my, my blog period, which is now 15 years old. So I've been doing it for a long time. This is the Mobile Creative Village. Uh, where Craig invited a group of artists uh, through funding at Peacocks to participate in this, these pop-up stalls uh, that could be moved around the town and then he had a pop-up mini ramp that his friend Mark would drive around for him. So even looking at that, you know, you think about the sort of health and safety and the sort of parameters that you'd get hammered with nowadays. There's no way kids would be getting to skateboard that close to a road with you know, active traffic going past it. But, you know, back in those days, you just did what you wanted. Uh, here's me doing a little stop motion workshop. I did stop motion animations and then we had a, a whole host of other people. There was poetry readings and performances and the, the, the work moved around. So this is in Union Terrace Gardens. This is it back in, uh, in School Hill, obviously. But it was the idea of taking art out there and exposing people to it, you know. I think this was 2010 uh, that this project was happening. And again, you know, outside Marks and Spencers, obviously health and safety had gotten onto them by that point. But uh, yeah, just so much fun, so freeing, you know, seeing art in that way and being able to show people like it exists, it's here. These are some of the artists that are doing stuff, you know. Uh, you just have to work a little bit to maybe seek it out, you know. Uh, it was quite a, quite a powerful thing. Here's Jim. So Jim set up the studios that we're sitting in just now. So he's another artist that I've been friends with for a, a long time. Really, really good guy. But yeah, just fascinating to see a project like this and to think what this would look like in sort of 2023 or, you know, how, how something like that could be sort of reinvigorated or could we, could we recreate it uh, and sort of improve upon the concept. But Craig as an artist has always been really interesting. This is Castlegate, another piece he did at Peacocks where you can't really tell, but this is the entire old gallery at Peacocks. So he filled it in such a way that uh, you had to walk around the side of this giant chucky that he'd, he'd built and you couldn't really get under here so it created this weird sort of one-way space dynamic uh, that was really interesting. And then this is some photographs of patrons at the castle gate and uh, a big sculpture that he made as well. So yeah, so, th so this was the revolutionary project that Craig did uh, where he, he made this giant eyeball out of fiberglass in his garage and then did a load of workshops at Project Slogan and then decided he would, he would wheel it into the middle of town. But it had a battery inside it. And then if you looked in the eye, there was actually some pretty psychedelic visuals because it was a kaleidoscope. And he would sit and turn the mirrored kaleidoscope while people looked in it. Uh, this is us leaving his, his house at the time in Hilton. And we pretty much got to the end of the street and then one of the wheels almost buckled. So his welding wasn't quite up to scratch on that one. But actually, it did, it made it all the way into town. And it was, you know, the reactions of people and seeing how people would sort of stop and, well, what is it, you know? It was, it was taking art to them and doing it in a really, this is where the wheel almost fell off. It was, it was doing it in a really fun way. You know, there wasn't the pretension and there wasn't the sort of gatekeeping. It was just, if you're interested, come up and have a look. But also come up and have a look and engage with it on your own terms, you know? Uh, I think it probably as many people came up and looked in and went, oh, that's really cool, as did come up and go, oh, this is a load of shite, what is it, you know? But that's the point, you know, that we, we weren't there to judge them, it was just there to sort of engage and to try and find some sort of connection. And of course for Craig, it was, it was this idea of sort of dragging this really heavy object around Aberdeen. 
became a real theme in a, in a lot of his work that we'll, I'll, I'll show you in a minute, you know. Uh, but yeah, just a super cool project. And of course, you know, things like this, I mean, Craig still maintains his website, so he's one of the few from my first blog post that actually still has an active sort of online presence in that sense. But, you know, like I was, I was out with the camera and I was filming and getting angles and just trying to document as much as I could. And this is, of course, before sort of, you know, camera phones were really up to scratch and technology was where it's at now. So this was like the only real sort of decent documentation or video documentation. He got stuck as well. <laughs> <laughs> oh, back we go. <laughs> but, you know, it, was, it, was, it, beca it became sort of important to me uh, in the work I was doing and trying to capture as much moments as possible or trying to capture as many of these kind of projects as possible, you know. That was Sai from Borderline, you know, just like, the fuck are you up to? <laughs> but great fun. I'll let it run until it goes into the, the actual kaleidoscope and then I'll move on. Because he had the Union Terrace Gardens was a focal point and outside the gallery and then outside Marks and Spencers, this was the sort of, the first major stop. And it's interesting as well, you know, I, so I can sort of look back on the archive of stuff and there's, there's people that maybe aren't with us anymore and there's friends that have moved away and there's like all these sort of lovely connections that I've found through doing the work that I do, you know, uh, and being able to sort of connect with people. There's also some people that I probably wouldn't want to speak to nowadays in some of the, some of the content as well. But yeah, this is what you saw when you looked inside the kaleidoscope. So it was like this secret world, which was actually a bunch of us getting pissed at Project Slogan, drawn on the walls while Craig's friends from Gabardine played a GABA set. So it was just like pretty heavy. Uh, so much so that my friend Chris, who is the ultimate party boy, came down and had to leave. He was like, oh man, I was out last night and I'm hungover. I don't think I can handle the, the GABA in the background. Oont, 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 oont. But, uh, you know, they were, they were good times. They were good times. Neil Henderson, lovely guy. But anyway, so the idea of pushing and pooling and moving around the city uh, became the central theme that I noticed in Craig's work. So this is a, a piece he did for uh, Look Again Festival in 2017, I think, called Through the Looking Glass, where he built a giant roller mirror that he could push around Aberdeen. And again, seeing the subcultures crossing over with this sort of contemporary and fine art world in the world of skateboarding. This is Neil, another, another great artist coming out of Borderline. So again, documenting and sort of making little films to try and capture these events as they happen. Uh, this is actually in the, in the foyer just out here. I stuck a GoPro onto it just to disorientate everyone, make them feel a bit sick. Here's Jim, looking happy. Of course, the Marshall Square development is just sort of completed. But, you know, even spaces like going down here and seeing the hospital all boarded up and how it's changed and then down into Union Terrace Gardens, you know, I sort of look back on these videos and sort of see the changes very much in effect in our city. You know, this is UTG as it once, once was. Uh, I won't share my thoughts on the new gardens. But, uh, you know, that's progress, isn't it? But it's cool to be able to look back and to be, be able to sort of see these moments, you know, and to see Craig's work sort of manifest in this way. And this was a piece as well, he was saying it was also about sort of challenging public space. So the idea that, you know, this is all public and we can go where we want and, and do what we want is actually a, a bit of a falsehood. So we took it down to Union Square, where uh, within about two seconds, the security guard was out having a bit of a shit fit, which I managed to capture on camera. Uh, oh, here we go. Oh, no. Oh, oh, come on. Oh, this is actually private property, lads. And if you're going to film, you need to get permission. Uh, which is weird. Actually, I should say I worked with him and he helped us out a bit with Katie's mural at Union Square a few years later. Uh, and he was incredibly helpful and kind, actually. So I should just put that out there. But yeah, again, seeing Aberdeen change and seeing sort of trends change in fashion and you know, the indoor market, that was the entrance to it. And just sort of being able to capture those moments has become quite important to me uh, in, in a sense with what I do. 
And of course, Craig documents all his work and he's got this amazing website. So I highly recommend having a look through and seeing some of his projects and seeing, you know, the connections uh, that I was speaking about and how he operates and being able to see that. And like I say, it's something that I've seen over the course of a decade plus through being friends with Craig and through sort of documenting his stuff. And again, looking at Craig's journey, it's an interesting one because I always think every artist introduces you to like five other artists. It's like dominoes. Once you've got one, you'll, you'll, you'll find a load more. And, you know, their journeys cross over. So Jim uh, and Craig set up Stray Dog. Craig was also into skateboarding. Uh, Jim and Craig and Brian all went to Greys. But then Craig also went on to do projects with Peacocks. And then so did Jim technically, but I've missed that one out. But then Jim sort of went on to set up Arcade Studios where Craig's also got a studio. And then Brian sort of hangs out and does some work at Peacocks. And then Craig and Jim got Look Again funding. And then you've got this audience bit, this manifestation of the art at the end. I actually tried to do this for every artist I've ever worked with. And uh, I, I gave up after about 60 lines because it was just getting too chaotic, trying to connect the dots, like literally connect the dots in that sense. And then of course, projects like the Dolphins are really interesting, you know, art trails, putting art in the public realm in that sense. I thought it was quite tacky and it wasn't really for me. Uh, and then I saw a couple of big hairy bikers get off their motorbikes outside RGU and pretty much do exactly the same pose as this. And I was like, ah, oh, uh, that's what it is. That's, that's what it's doing. You know, the people that maybe won't go into a gallery, it's given them a way to engage and to, uh, and to sort of cross over and see stuff. You know, and then seeing the photos like this, it's like, yeah, who doesn't want that? You know, why, why can't art do this as well, you know? Uh, and luckily I wrote a blog post about that because this is my partner, Mary Butterworth, who actually was one of the organizers of that project. Uh, so thankfully I wrote a blog post about realizing I'd become the art snob that I'd always sort of tried to avoid being because I didn't see the value in this particular project. But then once I did, I acknowledged my flaws. Uh, and then about six months later, I met Mary on Tinder and we started going out. And she was like, oh yeah, I, I curated, the, I helped with the dolphin project. So I had to confess, I was like, well, I have to confess that I didn't like it, but then I did like it. And then I actually really grew to love the concept of it. So I had this blog to show her. I was like, read this and then if you still like me, we can go on another date, but I wouldn't hold that against you if you don't. So this was it, the wild dolphins in Aberdeen. So trying to find, yeah, like an honest voice and sort of speaking about projects of that nature. And then of course, you know, it did great things. It was unseen, you know, the, the kids at Duthie Park sort of doing their chalk drawings. And this is an important slide. I'll come back to it later because the cafe manager at the Duthie Park came out and said, we can't have this, it's vandalism. And they actually sent council staff out to wash off the drawings in front of the kids. So they literally, that's the kids and their families there. So they literally had like 10 bairns crying their eyes out because their chalk drawings had been washed off as vandalism. So when I get to new art and the sort of street art stuff, you know, it's kind of important because that's how oppressive Aberdeen could be as a sort of visual city, you know, as a city that has artwork in the public realm. But another project that was really interesting was the Painted Doors. Again, sort of curated by Mary uh, and done through Aberdeen Inspired. And this was the idea that after sort of, I don't know, seven or eight years of blogging and connecting and meeting artists and meeting their friends and sort of trying to be uh, up and interested in what's happening, there was all these people that I'd never heard of. You know, Joe Fan, amazing oil painter, never heard of him. David from Peacocks, I didn't know he made art. You know, there was, there was, there was tons of them that I started to realize that my network was actually very small and I really needed a bigger sort of magnifying glass to be able to sort of identify everything that was happening. You know, even here, you know, you've got Michael Agnew, amazing artist. You've got David's work. You've got Claire Addy in his studio. You've got Fisher doing his big brew dog murals. Alan Sinek with his incredible collages and his music project. Maya, who's in the studio that does these like incredible weird performances. Uh, and then Derek Ashby, an incredible sculptor who taught at Gray School of Art. Uh, who is actually, I believe, Caitlin Hines' granddad. So I started to make these connections as well between some people I did know and then other people that I didn't. And then, of course, my beloved Mary, 
realizing that she was an artist that I met on Tinder. I had no idea uh, who she was, despite the fact we had lots of mutual friends. We'd been in the same gallery spaces. Uh, so find, meeting her and then finding out she was an artist was like a revelation. It's like, why have I not met this person before, you know? My, my soulmate, my partner. Uh, so thankfully, Tinder did the trick, you know? The, the digital world connected us, second time lucky. Uh, and seeing Mary's work was really quite interesting and seeing her journey you know, and seeing her go from these sort of quite beautiful sort of cityscapes. One of our first dates was sort of a wander down to the dark and dinginess of Denburn Car Park. But again, I hold Denburn quite close as a cultural space because it's where we go and skateboard. So it's, it's our, our space. Uh, but Mary was, was very much aligned with me and my sort of the things I was into and the sort of work I was interested in. And then, you know, being able to sit in the studio with her and see her sort of manifest these paintings out of nothing was quite amazing as well, you know. She's an incredibly talented artist in her own right. And yet I was seeing her do so much work to help others and to uplift others as well. So I felt like we were a really good match in that sense, you know. Uh, and this is, uh, I think it's called Forget Me Not. And apparently this is some roses that I gave her. Uh, probably for no real reason other than I wanted to buy her flowers. So she was like, that's a painting for you. Make sure you tell everyone, so that's <laughs> everyone told. And then of course, through Mary, I sort of discovered her dad. And again, it was another one, it was Howard Butterworth, you know, and I was like, who the fuck's Howard Butterworth? I've never heard of him. And then of course, you say that to my mum and say that to my granny, oh, Howard Butterworth, oh, the, yeah, famous, like Deeside painter. So obviously realizing that there was a lot more stuff out there than I could possibly ever hope to discover was uh, a bit disheartening but also like really cool as well, you know, like the idea of discovery, the idea, the idea of discovering the Beatles, you know, sort of 50, 60 odd years after they were in their prime, you know, I remember listening to David Bowie properly and being like, oh, wow, David Bowie, amazing, you know, so sometimes it's good to discover things later on. And of course, with Howard, he was an interesting one because he primarily worked outdoors uh, so, you know, if you were stumbling through the Highlands or up to Glen Mick, you might spot him out with his easel and his canvas, but he's not really going to be the kind of guy that's tweeting at you at four in the morning. You know, he's, he doesn't have that kind of digital presence in that sense. Uh, even down old Aberdeen, you know, he's, he's painted some pretty iconic views. And again, you know, it just made me interested in the idea of why some artists are well known, why some aren't. And then sort of looking at how I operate within the blog world and how I try to connect and where the sort of cracks are, you know, where's, where's the disconnect or where are the cracks that people are slipping through? You know, we've got Alan again, uh, you've got poets and, and Doric authors like Sheena Blackhall, you know, where does that fit into the stuff I'm doing in the blog? David Blythe and his weird sculptures in the gallery, Joe and his beautiful paintings, and then somebody like Alberto Morocco who is an incredible painter, but his career is, I guess, more well known down in Dundee in the sort of central belt. And yet he was born and raised in Aberdeen and studied at Gray's School of Art. You know, his work's absolutely fantastic. But back to some of my friends. Uh, this is my friend Anita, who I worked with at Project Slogan. So obviously the idea of putting art into bars is a great idea because all your mates come down and get pissed and then buy your artwork. So we weren't interested in having these established spaces that we had to do stuff in. We were sort of making our own spaces and putting work into places that we felt comfortable as opposed to trying to sort of fit in with uh, the establishment, you might say. And this is some of Anita's sort of early drawings, these sort of swirly images. And again, it was nice to see a sort of theme developing within our work. Uh, this is Katie Guthrie, a good friend, getting really hammered and probably buying a load of work off the wall. So yeah, art and bars is a great idea. Here's Joe, Joe Coleman, you know, great times. Uh, and this was the, the first project. So again, this is jumping back to 2008. And I was interested in the idea of people being able to look in the goldfish bowl in this sort of gallery space. And then if they did look in, this is what they might see. You know, we got this beautiful view of Anita's drawing looking out and then they would see me with my pants hanging out, thinking I was cool as the, the gallery flooded. Uh, but yeah, again, seeing people come in and seeing community forming around projects and people coming together was a really nice thing. Uh, and then seeing Anita's work evolve and seeing the sort of illustri illustrative style develop uh, was really cool. She went down and studied in London and worked there for a number of years. 
and then she's gotten into sort of music videos and uh, hand animated sort of uh, videos and the like. So really beautiful to see this development and seeing these sort of intricate worlds playing out in a different way. Uh, she also did a really fantastic public art project on Mount Hooley, uh, where she built a cart, so sort of similar to Craig, but the idea is everything she needed to do, everything she wanted to do could be contained within this one uh, cart that she had to drag from her friend's house up, in, up beside the Westburn Park. So it came with a glitter ball, as modelled by Siobhan here. Uh, but she did a whole range of events over a number of weekends where there was a sort of puppet show with the sunset in the background and there was a, a musical performance and there was poetry readings. So it was an idea again about taking space and not just being invited to do it. You know, it was about where can we, where can we make culture happen in our city? You know, and again, it comes back to that idea, nothing happens here, Aberdeen shit. And I'm like, but Anita's just dragged a massive cart down to Mount Hooley and done like a performance, you know? Like there is stuff happening. This was a, yeah, the puppet show and Stu was behind it with his little figures like, you know, you see in Thailand and stuff and the little sort of shadows of them dancing. And then somebody was turning the, the sort of pulling the landscape across and a bit of paper as well. It was fantastic. And again, sort of looking at cultural spaces, you know, Mount Hooley Roundabout has become quite well known as a cultural space. You can see where they buffed out the graffiti back in those days quite often. But, you know, somebody's managed to get a tag on here. And then this is some of my early photographs of Mount Hooley from sort of 2000, 2001. So I've always been interested in graffiti and, and connecting with that world as a subculture, despite not really considering myself part of it. I'm more of a person who's interested in it and documents it. Uh, this was my first graffiti photo of a bus stop across from my mum and dad's house in Maastricht. And I just remember being fascinated by the tags and trying to sort of decipher it. And it looked really cool as well, whereas I guess a lot of people maybe think, oh, that's messy, or, oh, there's graffiti, there's danger nearby, you know. So again, back to Mount Hooley, this sacred cultural space, uh, and a political space as well. So this is a photograph from 2008 that I think is probably as relevant today as it ever was, you know. How dare you repaint these walls when you have bigger fish to fry? You know, re-educate the racist. That's pretty much the entire Tory party. Feed the hungry, yeah pretty much staples, you know, do these things and then wash my paint away for it will be without purpose. I will have um, all I ever wanted. We will have won, but we haven't yet, have we, you know? But yeah, I mean, what, what compelled this person to do this? That's what I'm really interested in, you know? Uh, when it comes to the graffiti world, you know, what compels these writers and these artists to kind of go out and risk, you know, often life and limb to, to create the work they do, you know? And I discovered a little bit, here's my little Lego brick that I added uh, to this particular wall uh, many, many moons ago. So my, my journey, sort of doing work myself, but also being interested in the world of graffiti took me into interest in places like the Broadford Works and seeing these large scale pieces that people had been producing because they had time and they had a lack of, uh, a lack of authority bearing down on them so they could practice and get better and sort of have a, a bit of fun with it. Of course, it's a really scary uh, place to go into, uh, not because of the graffiti, but just because of how mad it is and how big it was. I actually filmed myself walking around and I remember being in here and there were sort of like big plastic drapes and every time it moved through the wind, it was like, oh fuck, somebody there, you know, so I had to take the, the sound off my video. But interesting, you know, the idea of cultural spaces and what has value and what doesn't, you know, looking at the shoe tag, here it is in sort of 2008 inside this sort of semi-protected space. And then here it is in sort of 2018, uh, where the whole building's been demolished and the whole site's essentially been cleared apart from the essential structures, you know, ready for a bit of gentrification and uh, probably some nice office blocks for some oil companies. But, you know, there was a real history in that building that unfortunately is lost, you know. So we speak about graffiti as being the sort of contemporary uh, sort of notion of it. But, you know, this is graffiti in the toilet block where the workers would sit and sort of, I believe this is supposed to be the, the, the manager of the factory, you know, so they would have a voice and be able to sort of show their dissent through graffitiing the toilets. Uh, but as I say, unfortunately, all this has been demolished and wiped away, you know, uh, ancient history. But yeah, really interested uh, in the notion of graffiti and why people do what they do. Uh, what drives them and motivates them, but also the idea that 
I really enjoy sort of capturing this subculture, but I'm very aware that I'm an outsider within it. And maybe not everybody wants to have their Instagram handle shared or wants to be featured in the local press. Uh, because there was a time where this would get you in quite a lot of trouble. And I, I believe still can. But, you know, why is there a painting of Kendrick Lamar in Dainston? You know, these are, these are mysteries. Why did someone draw the Grinch under Mount Hooley? And why did somebody put a little cat in this love piece, these bubble letters down at the inspired space? And Falcor, I love this. Somebody just went out and drew the dragon from the never-ending story. Like, you know, it's just, yeah, super cool. But yeah, connecting the subcultures, you know, and sort of looking for the secret messages. Liam is back. Is he? Where is he? Uh, and again, connecting with, you know, somebody like Andy Abjawa and seeing his work and the idea that, you know, he's making these sort of mosaic tile pieces and doing it because he knows a kid will see it and they'll connect to it. I thought that was absolutely lovely. But then also going out and doing the football paste up. So he's connecting subcultures in a sense. Uh, and, you know, if you don't know Andy personally, you maybe wouldn't connect those two things. But he'll certainly tell you about it. He's very open about what he does, you know. And then even for me, seeing the sort of emergence of stencils in our city and trying to make connections, you know, document stuff. This is Elkie in 2000, 2007, I think I took that photo. And another one that he never signed. And the garage would always sort of protect it and make sure the piper was there. Uh, despite buffing out all the graffiti, you know, so the idea of who's allowed to do stuff and who isn't. And then the Wolfman, you know, I remember, I remember walking down School Hill and seeing this on uh, uh, one of the red post boxes, and it, probably one of the first stencils I ever saw, it was like 99 or maybe 1998, and then it appeared on the grit bin at, uh, at Rod Street. And of course, if you know uh, Alex Craig, he made a number of sort of really great local skateboard films, then made some sort of Scotland-based skateboard films before moving to America uh, and working for uh, Vice TV. And then they got a, a budget to make a feature film called Macho Tail Drop. So the, the Wolfman stencil morphed and became the Man Wolf's patch on their jackets. So it was like a spoof skateboard film where it was about the industry and about the companies. And if you got on Macho Tail Drop, they were like the sort of the high echelons of skateboarding. And then all these grotty man wolves would sort of come out the sewer and come and like smash their ramps and try and mess things up. Kind of like what Aberdeen was like in, in the early 90s, to be honest. But, uh, you know, a lot of people wouldn't know the story of what the man wolves come from, you know, and what the lineage is and what the connections are between these sort of subcultures that we were immersed in. And then this, this, when I found these photographs, it almost made me cry a little bit. This is my first dark room after I left college in my granny's shed. So thinking about cultural spaces, you know, it's like my granny was kind enough to let me sort of work in her shed uh, and have space to sort of do things with spray paint and sort of experiment. And I could print photos as well because I sort of blanked out all the windows and stuff. Uh, and then I would go out and do these little army men stencils, sort of leaving my little my little messages for people that might be able to understand them. It was actually a project called The Art of Urban Warfare and the idea is you picked a colour and made toy soldier stencils and then your friends did the same and you built up little armies to fight. But I was the only person that ever played it. <laughs> so it was a lonely game. But you know, even uh, yeah, like the Garthy Bridge, you know, like going out, it's like I felt like a, a little revolutionary going out with my bomb stencils and sort of painting things like this. With, the sort of crappy scar, uh, car spray paint you could get from uh, from B&Q and stuff at the time, you know? So even though I wasn't doing graffiti, I was still finding my own roots into sort of public art and into street art. And of course, my, my real sort of uh, legacy with street art comes back to my friend Nicky. So this is, uh, this is Nicky here, Nicky Fitzgerald. And this is uh, some of the, the paste ups that he'd been doing. So he'd been putting this bear image up around Aberdeen. And I only found out at his funeral. So it was after he'd passed and some friends had put a bear on a box and put it on the Queen's head at Queen's Cross. It made the newspapers. That's how, that's how you know, big it was. Uh, not because people knew about Nicky and were celebrating his life, but because the local history society were scared some cardboard might damage the 100 year old bronze statue. <laughs> which is ridiculous. But Nicky and discovering his work became a real thing for me where it really got me into making street art. So I would put bears up in Nicky's sort of memory 
and then that led to me doing my own stuff and it became a sort of way to celebrate my friend and to pay tribute to him and also to show his family and friends that we still think about him and we still care about him uh, you know even though he's, he's, he's been gone for a long time but you know it's still been incredibly important to my story and my legacy uh, and a lot of the work I do, I can directly link back to sort of Nicky's influence, even just as a friend. He was, a, he was an amazing friend, uh, you know, and he's, he's dearly missed by many. But, you know, through that, it sort of instigated me going out on the streets with friends. This is his sister and we'd put the bears up and it became, you know, the sort of journey. And then I could communicate with my friend through putting up my own work beside it beside his original paste up. Some of these are still out there as well, 15 years on, which is amazing. You know, I climbed up onto that shitty bird ledge down at the green and put a bear on that wooden board and it's still there today, you know? So I look at that and I'm like, wow, that's like 15 years. Like, you know, it's been there a long time, but again, it's a, a sort of subcultural emblem that not a lot of people might, might understand. And then through Nikki's sort of stuff, you know, it's, it's encouraged me to go out and to paint bigger and to do more stuff. So this was a tribute I did in, uh, I think it was uh, during lockdown, actually, or the end of the first lockdown in 2020. And I, I decided this would be the perfect place to paint a big bear. And then I'd have these bears at the side and do a ring for every year that we've missed them. And, uh, you know, his family went down and took photographs and stuff. And then, of course, other artists started to fill in the other boards. So that was the intention about opening up public space, trying to use these street art techniques to sort of improve what's out there. And of course, you know, I'd been doing it since sort of 2007, really, uh, 2006. This is some of my early sort of lit stencils of the Lego bricks. Uh, but not everyone was happy about it. I did get arrested, as I said. Uh, and had to go in and sit in a police cell for an hour and then two hour police interview and it was like good cop and bad cop but the bad cop looked like the guy at a Mitchell and Webb so it was like oh my god like this is like actually really tragic and horrendous uh, and you would think they'd caught Banksy the way they behaved you know it was like I'm just like some dude who when everyone else is getting pissed on a Friday night I'm like out with a bag of stencils going like oh I'll do a little Lego brick here on a wooden board and, you know but uh, quite traumatizing as well, though, you know, going through that process and how they treated me, you know, like I remember coming out, out the, after the fingerprints and stuff and they're like, oh, you know, John, like we know you were just trying to brighten up the city. Like a guy sitting next to you in cells, you know, like he's up on murder charges. We didn't see you like that. And my face just dropped, you know, it's like, what? Are you saying that as a wind up? Like, what the fuck? So, yeah, you know, I, I learned firsthand, you know, the, the sort of the negatives that can go with sort of being involved in certain subcultures, but also just how important they kind of are, you know? And I, and I say I'm an international artist because I've, I've got work in Berlin, in Barcelona, London, next to Big Ben. And, you know, these little interventions, even though they're funny, like they, they do have a power, you know, there's power in stickers, there's power in putting up stencils and there's power in, in sort of street art, you know? Even if it's just a little symbol that lasts for a couple of, a couple of hours or a couple of days, you know? Uh, and, you know, stickers is something that's always been really important to me. And, I've, you know, this is my sort of decks uh, through in my studio that I've collected all these stickers by friends and artists and I bought zines off people and they put stickers in. So it's like trying to curate culture in a different way, you know? You might not find it in a gallery, but it's just as important and just as valuable. And, of course, I did paint a mural in Mount Hooley. So this is my first mural. A4 size, renegade. Uh, but, you know, it's amazing to see this sort of jump from what we were doing and getting buffed and seeing things getting covered over. But, you know, somebody would see that and they would do their piece next to it. So I could see the early street artists start to kind of emerge. And then, of course, they become cultural spaces. You know, here we've got my friend Jeb. Uh, you know, he wanted to go down and see some of the graffiti. So we headed down and had a look at some of the pieces that are there. You know, and people regularly come down here to see what's there, you know? And it's actually people like Jen at the back there that are kind of, have been real instigators of this change in our sort of public realm, you know, and, and taking graffiti and sort of showing people what it really is and what it means and the communities that can form around it. You know, I think that's a really important message to get out there. And, you know, back to the sort of stories and the secret symbols, you know, doing paste ups and doing this sort of stuff. But again, this was like conversations if you, if you knew what to look for, you could join the conversation, you know, so Craig had done these paste ups and then I did my paste ups next to it and then somebody tagged over it and then Craig did another paste up over the top. 
So there was always visual conversations happening in Aberdeen that I was really fascinated by. You know, people would try and tear them off. I always think that's really interesting. Like what compels somebody to try and, you know, and then it, and then it rips it and then it just looks a bit shit, but then it's kind of cool as well. You know, it's a record of the interaction. Someone's interacted with your art. Uh, and of course, as paste-ups, I got turned into a paste-up uh, by friends from Edinburgh. So they were trying to get me to join them for a road trip to go and see the Arc de Triomphe being wrapped uh, by a famous uh, Bulgarian artist called, uh, it was Jean-Claude and Christo, uh, a, a famous art couple. Uh, so yeah, we made it. That was us uh, in September in 2021. So during lockdowns and all this sort of COVID stuff, we made it over to Europe uh, and I actually got to go and see it. So I was interested in sort of this sort of almost internet meme culture. They sort of memed me here and were kind of taking the piss, but it sort of manifested into a reality. You know, so we got that photo with the arc in the background. Even made Damien Hirst's works like, kind of interesting. We went to see his giant cherry blossom paintings. They were fucking awful, really terrible, but anyway. And then again, looking at the sort of history of street art and the history of subcultures, and you start to get into, you know, Picasso speaking about graffiti uh, and his sort of ideology on it that New Art recently shared. I found that really interesting. And then things like the May 68 riots in Paris, which led the students instigated a, a 10 million people riot march uh, that called for revolution and called for public offices to actually look after their people. You know, and nowadays that act of revolution, these posters, these, these stencils and marks that the, the, the kids, the, the, the teenagers made in their university protests are now sort of lauded in museums, you know, and sort of shared as being the sort of great historical moments. And I like to think that some of the work I've captured could one day be featured in a show like that, where it's the documentation of these secret worlds within Aberdeen that are uh, have been proliferating and existing for decades, but a lot of people have turned a blind eye. But of course, you get onto things like New Art. This is Martin uh, Reed, the founder of New Art, who's been an incredible supporter and friend of mine. Uh, he actually DJed at Banksy's first London exhibition in London, I believe, and then ended up buying a load of canvases off the wall for like 30 quid. So he's got one of the biggest Banksy collections in Norway, I believe. Uh, and then this is Martin just a few weeks ago. We went over to see his own show. Uh, in Stavanger. So as well as curating new art and being a sort of a bit of a shit poster online, he actually puts his self, his, his, his own artwork on the line and actually does produce work as well. So, you know, I think that's quite a brave move. But I remember that one of the first conversations I had was about Banksy and street art and Ben Ayn and all these guys that I'd been reading about for years. And uh, I remember saying, I remember Banksy prints for 300 quid and I never bought them. It was too expensive on his website and I thought his prints were shit. Martin was like, oh, well, I bought them all and yeah, I've got the biggest Banksy collection in Norway. And so, yeah, I sort of kicked myself about that, but I'm still glad I never bought something just for the sake of buying it, you know? I would only buy art I was interested in, you know? And is this Banksy? Is this the man himself? But uh, New Art came in 2017 and really sort of, sort of showed us the kind of big power that street art can have when it's resourced and well-funded. Uh, so this is Martin what's on with his golfer mural that he painted at the side of Mackay's, which obviously is no longer there. And of course, a lot of people are interested in the murals and the kind of artwork. But for me, this, this became the sort of central thing. You know, this was a family that had come out of the art centre and their kids just ran over. And Martin, of course, was happy to speak to people. You could engage with an artist in this sense in a way that you never could before. You know, you don't get invited into artist studios very often. But if you were brave enough to come up and say hi, you know, one of these guys would maybe speak to you. And Martin actually put the names of the kids into this mural, which I thought was incredibly touching, you know. Uh, he even put my name in it. So when I did the first tour, I was like, oh, and here's Martin's work and here's the tags. And I was like, oh, and you can see the names of like Ethan and, you know, the little Claire and the other kids. And I was like, oh, and there's John. And I had a proper moment again, you know, it's like, oh, wow, like. You know, like I'm immortalized in a sense. Even my pal Devo had a little tag down here, you know. So it was great seeing how street art could actually engage with people and sort of cross boundaries in a way. Uh, and of course, you know, we've had lots of great artists visit for the festival and they all look to Aberdeen as a starting point for what they do. Uh, Ad Fuel with his sort of Andalus tiles, but he did them based on the Aberdeen tenement tiles after I sent him photographs. And John with the little kilted figures, you know, coming to Scotland. 
and even people sort of how they engage with the art. I believe Dr. D pasted this piece and someone came up and said, do I have to go, is, is the curfew started? Because they thought it was a real poster, you know? So looking at authoritarianism and, and how things sort of go in that sense. And then of course, you know, iconic pieces like the, the Heracute mural in the indoor market, you know, really seeing how people adopted these images and these artworks as their own and they could become a sort of new uh, emblem for the city and start to rewrite the narrative of Aberdeen. You know, it's not just an oil town, it's got street art and it's got internationally renowned street art as well, you know. Uh, again, 2021, we've got Fanaka Pan, you know, and these guys are all el like working at the very highest sort of level within their respective fields from photorealism to stencils to traditional painting with Henrik, you know. I remember watching him just go up with a brush. He had white shoes on, right? And he's going up with a brush and bucket paint and he just sort of did a couple of lines and stepped back and then did a few more. And it's like, oh my God, that's a mouth. And I could see the nose starting to form. And he just built it up from there, just mixing his colors and sort of painting on the wall, you know, something like a million followers on Instagram and sold out shows in New York and London. And here he is in Aberdeen, just sort of geeking out, doing a little portrait for us of the granite lady with the granite columns coming out her head, the diamonds. He'd, I don't think he got a single drop of paint on his clothes the entire time as well, which is unheard of. Uh, I've never seen any of the guys manage to do that. So phenomenal to meet these people and to work with them and to see their influence that they can have on Aberdeen. Uh, and also the connections that we can make. You know, we've got Vlad down here with James from Glasgow and Katie working with... Uh, with Hama Woods on her giant leopard stencils. You know, and somebody like Sam Smug, you know, I remember a lot of people saying like, oh, oh, the mural trail in Glasgow was smug, it's amazing and blah, 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 blah. And then suddenly folk were like, oh, we've got a smug in Aberdeen. So it kind of created this sense of civic pride that was quite, quite unique, uh, that was quite nice to see. But also I was like, well, if you like that, go and see the Glasgow stuff, go and see the stuff in Edinburgh, go see the stuff in London, you know. It can connect us as opposed to being a barrier or being a sort of uh, a shield that we need to use, you know. I love this little kid just posing here as well. He's got the, the little uh, MMM flacken tiles that he's filled in the potholes in UTG, you know, probably only about 10 years too late. And of course, UTG has now been uh, heavily changed. But another artist whose journey I'd kind of followed is my friend Katie, you know, and I remember her getting the invite for new art and it was... Uh, it was quite amazing to see her kind of step up to the plate and she decided she was going to paint the world's biggest Ken. So this is me mansplaining to her about where the lines need to go. Uh, as you can see, I wasn't mansplaining. If you know Katie, you, you don't get away with mansplaining. She would give you a slap. But uh, it was actually really special being able to work with my friend and being able to work on that, that, that particular production. And that's what linked me in with the sort of guys at History of Art, because they'd shared this photo from, from their trip to Berlin to see this particular painting. And I was like, oh, we've got one of them in Aberdeen. You didn't have to go all the way to Berlin. So this is uh, Julio recreating one of the sort of Dutch masters uh, on a, a rough hewn granite gable end, uh, just round from the studio here, actually. And that was the finished piece, complete with sort of gilded frame and drop shadow. You know, so it was interesting looking at the connections and how art can connect us uh, and connect us with different people, you know. And certainly, you know, with friends like Katie, you know, this is one of my favourite photos. Katie having a bit of a wobble and I was able to be there and support her to sort of, you know, see her vision through with her sort of her first new art mural. Uh, and of course, I did all the productions that year in 2021, which was uh, a, a real honour, but also incredibly tough as well. I had some pretty uh, sad personal news about uh, my dad. And I remember sort of halfway through and friends like Willem and Tazzy sort of stepped in and took over some of the productions for a little bit just to give me a break. Because of course I didn't realise New Art is a two-week festival uh, and it's all chaos and there's 10 or 12 artists and it's all go and then, you know, you do your two weeks and then you, you have your come down and then you go back to normal life. Whereas this was seven weeks. So one week production, one week production, one week production, a couple of days off, one week production. And of course, I was just switched on the whole time. You know, I was like, what do I need to do? Is a lift in place? Is there issues? What's health and safety? Who do I need to get paint from? So I was just constantly going round in circles. And then of course, Helen Burr came and was just like the most chilled out, amazing artist you could work with. And she, uh, she painted her friends and their newborn baby, which was an, an amazing uh, mural to have. But I can remember when she said, I think I'm done. 
and this was the very last production and I sort of went over here and had a cry for about a minute and then pulled myself together and came back and we packed down the site. But again, you know, uh, I, I became the art, which was a, an incredible honor. You know, it's not something I've ever looked for. And certainly with this one, I remember leaving Helen painting another portrait down at the green. And I didn't want to be that guy and be like, where are you? What are you doing? Blah, blah, blah. So I was like, oh, I'm, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll catch you later sort of thing. And then I caught her painting and I thought, oh, cool. She's doing another one, another mini dude. So I started filming and took some photographs and I was like, shit, it's me. And I got really embarrassed and ran up to School Hill and then messaged her and I was like, if you need anything, just let me know. Otherwise, I'll, I'll get you tomorrow. And she was like, I'm on School Hill. Come and find me. Like, I'm on, you know, I'm on Union Street. Come and see. So, I, of course, I was like, oh, she wants me to see it. So I was able to sort of come down and sort of see it. She was doing the text and stuff. Really quite special, you know, special memory for me. And, but of course, you know, this, this artwork lasted a year and now it's been covered up and he's got like a, a turban and he's got a machine gun. And there's all sorts of posters being stuck over it. So nothing lasts forever uh, when it comes to the, the, the streets. But, you know, through the festival, we do, we do have amazing moments. You know, like we had Seb Madak from the New York Times. And I love the fact that everyone was like, oh, my God, Aberdeen's like, you know, the number of whatever it is must visit place in the New York Times. And I was like, well, it's not ranked that way. Actually, Seb, Seb's trip to Aberdeen was to take a train from London, the overnight Caledonia sleeper. That was the trip. It wasn't about Aberdeen. It's just the fact that was the next like destination. So he did the train trip. And then, of course, he, he got in touch and came on a street art tour. And we just introduced him to all our friends and showed him the creative network that we have in Aberdeen. And, you know, showed him the cool food places and just showed him the Aberdeen as we see it. And he wrote this amazing article, you know, to be able to have headlines like this, uh, where he was sort of bigging up Aberdeen, you know, and uh, pushed by this dedicated band of local artists. You know, that wasn't me. That was Jen and Chris and Willem and, you know, Ica and everyone else that's doing stuff in the city, you know. So it was really nice. I introduced him to my friend Steve Murison and I, I remember texting him and I said, Seb, do you want to meet a Scottish wizard? And he was like, what? So I introduced him to Steve, who is a Scottish wizard, uh, very much uh, a, an incredible artist and friend as well. So that was, you know, that was the start of his article. I got a text from John Reed, do I want to meet the Scottish wizard? <laughs> and it's, you know, my friend Steve, who draws mad psychedelic cat paintings. It was just fantastic. But yeah, so, you know, through new art, it's really shown me that I can shout about art and I can engage these audiences that maybe we didn't go into traditional spaces. Uh, and we can do it in a way that is hopefully meaningful and gives people a sense of what new art is and what it does. And they can take something away from that as well. You know, and they can feel a, a sense of ownership. And, you know, we don't tell people what to think or what to feel about the work. We just want to give them the information so they can make their own minds up and then they can be the sort of the, the arbiters of its value or if it's good or it's bad or whatever. And of course, you know, through the festival, we do projects like Chalk Don't Chalk. So this is the uh, outside the, the high energy social space that is RX uh, around the corner. Uh, and of course, you know, now the kids get to draw freely with the chalk in Aberdeen because the festivals help to put that in the public consciousness that this isn't a bad thing to do. You know, you don't need to rush out with your, your water and your brushes to get rid of it. You know, it's OK to have kids engaging and making artwork and doing things that mean something to them, you know, and it will naturally wash away. So I think that's a nice connection back to the sort of dolphins and the story that Mary told me about the kids having their work washed away and then seeing what a project like New Art can do and that the kids are all out with their families, getting their faces painted, discovering street art, discovering art and finding out about the, the sort of cultures in our city, you know. I haven't really talked much about the sort of galleries and institutions, although Aberdeen Art Gallery has played host to some amazing shows. Uh, this is Ron Mook. Uh, the giant baby being taken in back in 2009. So this was part of the art rooms. Uh, so again, you know, there's, there is a lot of value in their spaces and the work that they do in there as well. Uh, that was a truly phenomenal show. You, know, you can just see the size of that. It was just through in this single room on its own. It's like, oh my God, like super lifelike as well. Uh, incredibly lifelike. And we always joke that this is actually my friend Donald for the Isla Lewis because he's a spitting image of Ron Muick as well. So we always have a good laugh about that. But yeah, you know, there's so many uh, sort of untold stories and secret histories of art and culture in our city. 
you know, uh, Ralph Steadman coming to Aberdeen. I recently met the photographer Alan, I think it was, who'd invited Ralph to Aberdeen to come and produce work at Peacock Visual Arts. And then one of the first prints he did was, was a, a print for William Burroughs that they then additioned and took over to William Burroughs and him and Ralph and a friend fired bullets at it. So each print in the edition has individual bullet marks, unique. So they're, although they're the same print, essentially they are unique because of the bullet holes and signed by William Burroughs as well. I don't know if you've ever tried to read William Burroughs' work, like Naked, is it Naked Lunch? And Metamorphosis or something? Horrendous. I couldn't, I couldn't handle it. It was too much for me. But you know, but that's cool. Like it's good, it's good that, uh, you know, to have things that are challenging. And then of course, back to the blog and what I do and the support mechanism. So I started off Muda Collapse blog and it was very much a personal thing. Uh, and of course it was great because I, I wasn't accountable to anyone and I didn't have anyone telling me what to do and I didn't do sponsored posts and I didn't turn on the ads for Google. So you'd have stupid adverts down here bugging you. You know, I very much kept in line with, with my ethos of being a bit DIY and a bit sort of renegade and a bit punk. But then at the same time, I would have lazy spells where I wouldn't post anything for months at a time, even though things were happening. So this year, I've sort of changed it up a bit and I've pulled my head out of this giant sculpture uh, and I've started to do more. But what I've discovered is the blog's really starting to act as a bit of an archive because I've been doing stuff for so long that you can plug in something like Luke again and you can start to see a little archive of some of the events and exhibitions and, and projects that they've worked on. And the same for people like Craig and Mary and Katie and uh, Chris and other friends as well. And then trying to big up the artists, which was always important. So I've got my own A to Z where I try and curate what are the artists I know of. You know, there isn't really much of a hierarchy or much of a, a, a dependency on knowing me personally. It's more just if I, if I find you on Instagram or I think I've seen your stuff, then I'll try and add you to this list so people can actually see, you know, oh, Aberdeen's shit, nothing happens here. There isn't many artists. And it's like, well, there's actually like hundreds, if not thousands out there uh, who, you know, are worthy of your attention. So I do that. And then, of course, trying to connect those dots in a really meaningful way. So looking at our creative spaces. Here's Chris here, who's sitting in the audience. Uh, you know, and trying, to, and trying to get into areas that I'm not so comfortable. So, you know, dance and performance is an area that I've never really had much interest. And yet, through the neighbours being City Moves, I've discovered a whole new world of excitement and performance through the amazing work that they're doing. And I was very aware that I had these sort of these these uh, blind spots to certain elements of culture. So, you know, my idea uh, with the blog now is that I'll have contributors that will focus on different things and actually take a critical stance with stuff as well, you know. Uh, but one of the one of the support mechanisms I was looking at outside of the blog is obviously having the YouTube channel and making artist videos. Uh, some are documenting events and exhibitions, some are videos that artists have used to then uh, apply for grants and apply for opportunities. So, you know, actively helping them in that sense. I do the Dean scene where I try and collate as much cool shit as I possibly can in one newsletter, which I discovered is quite uh, difficult because you only see so much in the preview and the email. So I had to try and start cutting it down and be a bit more meticulous in how I laid it out. Otherwise, people were going to miss loads of stuff because not everyone clicks on the view and browser, but, but uh, if you subscribe to the Dean scene, do click view and browser and you'll see there's a whole load of stuff usually at the bottom. So again, active support mechanism and trying to support culture and big it up. And then the art club is another one that's been really important. So connecting with people and taking ourselves into creative spaces and holding space and asking the galleries and the artists and the people there to sort of speak to us about the work. So if you ever feel intimidated going into a gallery, then come to Art Club because we go and challenge that notion and break down those barriers. Uh, and of course, you meet lots of amazing people uh, like my friend Jev, obviously, who kind of inspired the Art Club. Although this is uh, him with, uh, it was one of the sculptures by Kenny Hunter and uh, Jev didn't realise it, but he tried to stand up by holding on to it. And I could see the gallery staff having an absolute shit fit as he tried to haul himself out of his scooter on this sort of like 10,000 pound sculpture. Uh, but you know, sometimes it's good to challenge and sometimes it's good to sort of poke and prod a little bit, you know. Uh, but yeah, and you know, the art club gets to go and visit and artists have been really receptive. So Mark McCracken 
uh, invited us to a special opening he hosted for his work over at the Art Centre and was kind enough to explain his work to the, to the members of the group that came out with us that day. Uh, so it's really nice, you know. And then obviously through the studios, like another support mechanism we have where we try and support artists and put on projects. Although this space is now closed, we've kind of moved in here. So we're sort of starting to continue some of the work in a new environment. Uh, but the ethos is the same, which is essentially just supporting artists and giving them opportunities where we can and showing our sort of collective might within the sort of local scene. Uh, and then this is where you can find me. So this is all my uh, all my ads. I thought I better do one of those sort of branded things, uh, which I'm still not entirely comfortable about. But I don't know. If I'm going to do it, I might as well shout about it. So, and then just some boring stuff. Uh, so the blog all time views is three hundred fifty three thousand at that moment in time, uh, which sounds amazing. But then you think about fifteen years of doing it, it's fucking terrible. So I'm not a very good salesman. I'm not a very good promoter. Uh, but at the same time, I am kind of proud that, you know, over a quarter of a million views on, on the content, primarily local content as well that we've posted. And then, of course, uh, I started looking at the sort of Facebook analytics just as a, as a thing. Uh, and as you can see, I'm a big deal in Ellen. You know, people in Ellen are paying attention. Inveruri as well. Uh, Stonehaven, we've got fans out there, you know, primarily women. Mary Butterworth, you better watch yourself. <laughs> but uh, I don't actually, I don't understand this. I don't really care about that. Uh, it's very much about the sort of day-to-day -day interactions and things like this. You know, it's the real world interactions where I think the real value comes from within culture and within what I do. Although, you know, it's good having these platforms where you can sort of shout and amplify, especially the work that others are doing. You know, and this, this was uh, some of the things I was a, a bit frustrated about when I was started to think about the sort of mechanisms and the, the network that we have, you know, where the artist is kind of important and he goes to the art school, which can be important. And the art school can give you opportunities through certain groups or it can lead you to projects with different people. But ultimately, what we're concerned with is the artist making the art and then getting it to an audience. But sometimes to do that, you need the funding. The funding's always the hard bit. And if you remove the artist, then the sort of the, the, the pyramid scheme falls flat, you know? We need the artist to make the art to then connect it with the audience. You know, again, if you remove the funding, it gets a bit difficult. But really for, for me, it's about the idea of, of sort of changing these, uh, these mechanisms and being able to connect the artist with the audience through the art and through the organizations and the organization's connecting with their audience as well, because it's amazing how many organizations are fucking terrible at social media. So yeah, so I'm interested in how we sort of break out of that sort of models and how we connect everything and have much more of a re reciprocal kind of creative culture in Aberdeen, you know, where the art gallery will support the smaller organizations and the, the smaller artists, while also getting attention from their audience and, and giving them stuff, but their audience is given back and giving them good good work you know that's a healthy sort of mechanism so yeah so basically what I discovered is is like each one of these is like an artist that I've sort of collected or a story that I've collected over the years through the blog so that becomes that over the 15 year span and it becomes all the friends and all the people that I've, I've connected with uh, over the years which I thought was really nice uh, you know and and seeing these people and being invited into these incredibly personal spaces where people actually make work and where people are creating is incredibly, uh, you know, I don't take it for granted. Like it's quite, quite a special thing for me. You know, this is, this is spaces that trigger that little happy thing in my brain and sort of make it feel like it's worthwhile, you know, to have the portrait of Peter with his sort of paper suit that he did a dance performance in, you know, it's like, like, I love that photograph. John Cromar playing his noise gig here a few months ago, you know, after 20 odd years of documenting him and his work. Really, really cool. And yeah, and then essentially this is why I do it, you know, because it's about meeting people and connecting and making friends and seeing cool stuff and telling other people about the cool stuff, you know, and sometimes being uh, behind the curve and sometimes being ahead of it and sometimes looking at the art that's making the news upside down and meeting your heroes like Shepard Fairey and connecting with an incredible artist like John, having your name on a wall, 
you know, meeting friends in strange countries and putting artwork up together and seeing your art travel and, you know, m hanging out with friends that you, in another life, you would never have crossed paths with. But thankfully, through art and culture and music and skateboarding and tattoos and all the other stuff, you know, we have this incredible uh, photo here. So yeah, that's it. Cheers. <laughs>